I hope that people never see what happens to people who get shot. You can't bring your sister-in-law into the emergency room and see this is this is the reality of somebody who got shot. That's not feasible. But for what it's worth, talking to an emergency doctor for 35 years, you don't want to see that. And it's not, and if the chance of that happening to your loved one is one in 10,000 or one in 100,000, then you need to pay attention to that because you could be a victim of that and somebody in your family could be a victim of a crime of passion or uh, a suicide um, if the gun is unsecured and, and left to irresponsible people. Hello and welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the Executive Director, and today we're talking about a topic that is ever-present in our collective consciousness, gun violence. We're asking today, is healthy gun ownership ever possible? People always express great shock at the number of cars we Americans own. It's a total of 267 million. But this figure is peanuts compared to gun ownership. The total now stands at 425 million. The US population is only 332 million. So do the math. Most people would say that by any measure, that number is a problem. So today we're going to look at our relationship with guns to try and better understand how we got here and to discuss how and if we can navigate our way out. We're pleased to welcome two speakers, Ryan Bussey, a former executive at Kimber America, a major gun manufacturer and author of the book Gunfight, My Battle Against the Industry that Radicalized, that Radicalized America. And he's joining us from Montana. Dr. Mark L. Langdorf is professor of clinical emergency medicine at UC Irvine. He's also editor in chief of the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. Mark is joining us from California. Welcome to you both, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So first, Ryan, let's start with you. This is a riveting book uh, in terms of detailing your own personal life, uh, but also the history of the gun industry in America, which I didn't know a great deal about. Uh, it's frank and clear, but extremely disturbing particularly the account of you and your family attending a Black Lives Matter rally in June 2020 in Kalispell, Montana, which is only five miles from your home. But before we get to that, let's just pull up a chart. This shows America's place in the World League of Gun Ownership, and it is top of the chart by far. Most people would ask, how did this happen? So maybe you can help us understand um, in a brief synopsis, how do we get here? Well, it's not brief, but I'll, I'll try to condense it <clears throat> as much as, as we can. First off, um, you know, America in many ways was, was kind of born with a gun in its hand. Um, we were born of armed revolution. Um, and so many of our founding myths were um, centered around firearms. Um, this sort of conquering of native native populations with firearms, with you know, a cult, a gun that won the West, right? Um, and of course, it's enshrined. Um, there are debates about what what that amendment means in our constitution, but it's enshrined in an amendment in our constitution. And so, there are many ways in which the United States' relationship to guns is different than almost any other nation on earth. And obviously, um, we we see that now with the sort of rate of firearms ownership we have. I think too um, the, the and and I you know as I note in the first part of my book, there is and has been a healthy part of uh, cultural America that involves guns that does not have to be dangerous or intimidating or um, you know violent. It, it doesn't have to celebrate insurrection. But sadly, I think we we are at a place now where the leading edge of gun culture does those things. It is a totemic issue for the extremist right. It's not an accident that the three percenters, the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys all count radicalized views on firearms amongst their founding beliefs. And so I do think this, this is the central subject and test for our democracy. I think a, a right 
that is so unbelievably powerful and can so immediately impact the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness of fellow citizens must be counterbalanced with um, a commensurate responsibility. And that either comes through regulation or social norms. So I think our our right and freedom versus responsibility balance is out of whack now. And um, and I think that's that's probably why we're we're here today on this webinar. So, I mean, um, you yourself, as you say in the book, are a, a kind of proud outdoorsman. You, know, you were raised uh, on a farm. You have always had a relationship with guns growing up. But who are the new gun owners? Because you said there are 8 million new gun owners since 2020. And your concerns are about the training, their knowledge of weaponry, where they keep them. Perhaps you could explain a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So let me start by saying prior to about 2005 or six, the firearms industry itself, I know because I was in the middle of it, had a sort of self-imposed decency and responsibility and code of norms placed upon itself. It would not allow things like um, tactical rifles, tactical gear, and for most for most intents and purposes, like AR-15s, that sort of tactical stuff was not allowed to be displayed in its own trade shows. It's not that it was illegal. It's not that it was banned. It's that the industry itself made a choice, formed a cultural norm, and did not allow that. Um, and and so for for much of the 20th century, um, with guns, 20 and 21st century with guns, there was a sort of self-imposed responsibility where training was at least espoused or supported, permitting was espoused and reported or, or supported by the industry, and um, the sort of marketing towards fear, civil unrest, even civil war, even harming your neighbors, that was that was thought to be, you know, it, that was distasteful. It, it, it did not happen. It was relegated to the dark corners of the industry. If you look at, you mentioned 8 million new gun owners. In 2020, most likely the most fearful kind of tumultuous year any of us can remember with the most, we had COVID, lockdowns, Antifa, George Floyd, Black Lives Matter. I mean, we had a president heaping fuel on all of this. We had, at the end of, of that year, we had a, a, an almost a successful insur uh, insurrection through our, federal, through our federal government. Not a year that... Probably there's no year that can uh, compare to that with regards to fear and conspiracy. And in that year, eight million new gun owners came into the market. My point here is is that um, the basic fear and conspiracy, which can be used to drive irrational actions in our society and in our voting populace, also drives firearms ownership. And when firearms ownership happens very quickly because of fear and conspiracy. I think we can expect some bad outcomes to come from that. Most of those people are not trained. They did not grow up a firearms culture. They 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 didn't have a culture like I did, where safety and responsibility were were literally just beat into us from the time we were very small kids, right? So I don't think it's an accident now that we see the sort of spillover effects, gun violence, school shootings, things of those sorts, because that so many of the new gun owners are untethered from any sort of norm, basic behavior, basic good behaviors and responsibility. And, and talking alongside that, perhaps you could go back to what you talk about in the book, which is the election of Obama being kind of watershed moment about what changed in the psyche. And then there was a kind of moment after that when gun sales dropped. After well, I think, so just if we look, it's very difficult to divorce fear, conspiracy, and race from firearms sales in America. I wish we could. I wish they were not linked. Um, but the truth is, they are. If you don't believe me, prior to 2007, when our first Black president started to lead in the presidential polls, the United States had never consumed more than about 6 million brand new firearms in a single year. It was it was bumpy, but relatively flat, somewhere between three and six million for the pre a year for the previous 20 years. I know that sounds like a lot, but what I'm getting ready to tell you is going to is going to dwarf that. So Barack Obama starts to lead in the polls in 2007. Um, by the time President Obama leaves office in eight years, the United States is consuming consuming almost 17 million new guns in a single year. So from less than seven to 17 in eight years during um during the presidency, eight-year presidency of Barack Obama. In 2020, this year that we just talked about, 
again, the most fearful, hatred failed conspiracy driven year we can remember 2020, almost 23 million guns were sold in a single year. So, you know, when people tell me that fear and hatred and conspiracy aren't linked, like the marketing isn't linked to gun sales, I say, uh, uh, just that's that's silly talk. Just look at the data. OK, so tell us a bit about the um, assault rifle ban that was reversed in 2004. Um, until then, as you say, the gun industry had this kind of fragile social contract of sorts where things were just considered unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, sport was largely a associated with owning a gun. Yeah. It wasn't seen as a kind of a, a military um, item you had in your home. Um, you said you worried that this unhealthy relationship now is impacting democracy and feeding thinking, extremist thinking, and then this affects all other freedoms. What, yeah. what do you mean by that? Yeah. September 13th, 1994, Bill Clinton signs the crime bill, which contained what we now call the assault weapons ban for 10 years. And at the and a couple of notes, which which I do note in the book, that bill passed largely because of the lobbying of one very powerful Republican person. That person was President Ronald Reagan, who sent letters to every member of Congress urging them to pass the assault weapons ban. And he, and he named the assault weapons ban. So if you want to sort of get a picture of how things have changed, that's how things have changed. Now, importantly, in my opinion, the ban was not very effective, right? It didn't ban the sale of AR-15s. You could buy as many AR-15s as you You could buy them by the truckload during the assault weapons ban. The assault weapons ban said if an AR-15 has a couple additional features on it, most of them, which people on this call and the average American would not, you could not explain those features, like what is a flash suppressor? What, you know, they they weren't they weren't defining features of the gun, but if you added more than two of those to the gun, it became an assault weapon. That gun became banned, but the basic AR-15 was not banned. And if I showed you a pre-banned gun and a post-banned gun, one that was legal and illegal during the ban or not during the ban, you could almost nobody could tell the difference. But what what I I say what the assault weapons ban did do was codify this social sense of norms of good behavior that I talked about earlier. And it essentially told the industry and many people in gun culture, look, these things are powerful weapons of war, and maybe it might not be a good idea to propagate them uncontrolled with irresponsible marketing throughout a complex society. I think that was the power of the assault weapons ban. I don't think it was very effective legally or in regulatory terms, but it was important in, in terms of social norms and, and responsible behavior. And it, by the way, it sunsetted September 13th in 2004, because at the behest of the NRA at the very last minute, there was a 10-year sunset ban provision placed in it, which means whoever was president 10 years after that signing ceremony of Bill Clinton, who, and it happened to be George Bush at the time, if they didn't renew that ban, and Bush promised to renew it up until the election, then he got elected, and then he did not renew it, um, all they had to do was do nothing, which then, then the ban went away, and it did go away in um, September of 2004. So you spent 30 years, uh, a big part of your life in a career that you believed in, in an industry you thought that was decent um, and in control. Um, and then you ended up being VP of sales for Kimber. Um, what made you break up with the industry and testify last, I think it was in 2022 to Congress? about mass shootings and irresponsible marketing of the gun industry? Well, when I got into the industry, again, I grew up and I tell stories about my childhood, which is not, it's not dissimilar from many childhoods in America today, um, where responsible behavior is, is part of firearms ownership. And for the first part of my career in the firearms industry, I think those sorts of norms and that responsible behavior was adhered to, not perfectly, much like our political system was much simpler and, and different, you know, 25 years ago, it wasn't perfect. But we didn't we didn't measure mass shootings in the 1.4 per day, right? And it, just like we didn't have the sort of political division that we have today, 25 years ago. And what happened for me is, as I realized that the that the NRA and very powerful political forces were combining with the firearms industry to create this kind of all or nothingism in our politics, which I think now infects all areas of our politics. As I saw them doing that and dispensing. And, and really victory at all costs kind of philosophy. So dispensing with the old um, responsible behaviors, 
starting to push um, AR-15s and irresponsible marketing at all costs. Um, this, this sort of um, embracing of the tactical culture as the driver of the firearms market. And tactical, by the way, means planned offensive military operation. And now the vast majority of guns and gear sold in the United States are called tactical. Again, tactical means planned offensive military operation, not defensive. I, I believe in the right to self-defense. If you're being attacked, I believe you should be able to defend yourself. Nobody has the right to self offense. And yet we are marketing towards self offense. And so when you see, for instance, on January 6, two types of flags, you see Trump and political American flags, some of them weird and combined with um, Confederacy, the, a, a losing Confederacy, which I don't quite understand. And you see AR-15 flags, right? The AR-15 and that weapon of war have become the totemic issue for the right and that is fueled and marketed to by the firearms industry. And that sort of shift troubled me very greatly. So we've lost our kind of conscience in the gun industry, basically. Um, what I'm afraid did, we have, yeah. And, and is that just driven by the profit margin uh, or is it a combination of fear and the profit margin that have been coupled together? In my opinion, the NRA after Columbine, the NRA began to stumble onto this idea that all or nothing politics combined with fear and conspiracy could be used to drive sort of unpredictable emotional outcomes in politics that were both profitable from a political standpoint and a monetary standpoint, and also they built power. And the same things that drove those political outcomes happened to drive firearm sales. Um, which is why you saw this weird conflagration, really dangerous, weird conflagration in 2020, right? The same the same things that drove Trump and Trumpism drove gun sales, the exact same recipe. And um, so I, I'm fearful now that, and I think it's dangerous when you have a democracy, half of a political system in a democracy where um, fear and conspiracy and racism and hatred are, are used to drive political outcomes also drive firearm sales. Like I I just again, I'm just a farm kid here, but I, I don't think those things I don't I don't think that's a recipe for a good outcome. But you're right. Um before I move over to Mark, I just wanted to um talk about the fact that I think you said 28 states now allow concealed carry. Uh well no so concealed carry is now ubiquitous across the United States, but 28 states now have rolled back any kind of permitting. That's called constitutional carry. So um, up until just a few years ago, everywhere you concealed carry, you would have to go through some kind of firearms training class. You would have to be permitted. Your background would be checked again, or a variation or a combination of all those things. Now you have 28 states, Florida being one of the latest, to say, nope, no permitting, no check, no you know, no, no safety classes, Let's no proficiency tests, just go do it. Um, I don't know, for something that can that can impact the lives and rights of fellow citizens so easily, I, I, I just don't see how that's a responsible uh, policy approach. How do we get to that point? Again, because guns and, cult and, and the sort of signaling around guns are totemic for the right, right? You, nobody on the right, as I, as the analogy I often use is, you know, background checks, for instance, polls, universal background checks, polls at 85%. Why can it never pass? That means lots and lots of Republicans have to support universal background checks. Why doesn't it? Because it's it's as if it's a beam in the Republican House, right? They look up there and they're like, well, there's asbestos chipping off that thing every day. And somebody says, yeah, eventually that's going to give us cancer. And then somebody says, yeah, we should pull that beam out. And then they say, well, wait a second. If we pull that beam out, our whole house comes crumbling down. And then everybody looks around and says, yeah, I'll tell you what, let's just live with the asbestos. We'll just get cancer slowly over time. So that, that nobody can yank that beam out of the house because they're fearful it's what holds up the whole, it, it is the totemic issue of the right. If you don't believe me, <laughs> what are the Christmas cards that the most radicalized Republicans send out? Lauren Boebert or, uh, I mean, they all have guns on them, right? Some of them have the M60, the gun of Rambo, um, a fully auto you know, machine gun used only in war. So, I mean... It, Again, you put those on Christmas bars because they're totemic, symbolic issues. So I was reading some research today. The New York Times or yesterday did an article talking about who is it that buys guns and why. 
looking at the sort of psychology of it. And it seemed to show that those people that have guns feed their paranoia. So if you carry a gun, you're very likely to use a gun. Um, so um, <laughs> can you maybe talk us through just a couple of these slides, which is how the marketing uh, is so insidious? Um, so that first, that first slide, um, that's, that's called the Man Card Campaign. That was launched in 2010 by Bushmaster Farms, purchased by Remington, eventually all of it purchased by a large private equity group. And the private equity group wanted to drive sales inside of an industry that really had resisted this kind of marketing up until then. This was really the first kind of cutting edge, in my opinion, truly horrifically irresponsible ad. And what this, they they placed this ad in places like Men's Journal, um, Maxim Magazine, and places where young men, um, you know, obviously um, that's what, that's who they were targeting. And the idea here is that you did not have a man card if you did not have a Bushmaster rifle. You did have a man card if you did have a Bushmaster rifle. And if you look at um, if you look at the actual man card, which is this thing over here on the right that you're looking at, this is the actual verbiage of the card that you got in a world of rapidly depleting testosterone. Testosterone. The Bushmaster man card declares and confirms that you're a man's man, the last of a dying breed, with all the rights and privileges duly afforded. You carry it in your wallet, ready to show at a moment's notice, instantly ending discussion for any who would doubt you. That's 20, 2010. If that doesn't foreshadow some of the things that we saw in 2020, I don't know what does. Also, very importantly, that was the gun that was used by a troubled young man in Sandy Hook, in a school called Sandy Hook. This is a this is actually a photo um, about the same year I took at an NRA convention of a young boy. Several young kids were taking turns behind this helicopter gun posing and their parents were taking pictures of them as they were laughing. That's a 80 pound 50 BMG helicopter gun meant to kill people and disable vehicles at a range of about a mile and a half. And so there were people lined up here with putting their kids behind this, um, laughing and taking pictures of this. And I knew I saw that and I knew we had a problem. Here you have, um, this is a recent magazine cover, firearms industry magazine cover. So you see, this is what I was speaking to earlier. If fear and conspiracy sells, then why not market it? Um, and, and here you have kind of a, a redo of some of the scenes that we saw across the country in 2020, where you have social unrest, and then you have the heroic young father with his tactical shotgun um, defending his family against the, the ruffians. Um, I do... Uh, just a bit of humor. I never have understood what the ninja chick in the background is. Um, it's it's a it's still baffling to me, but um, I think you can get the idea here that this that, that fear and conspiracy are now a marketing tool. This is the social media post from Daniel Defense. Daniel Defense sold and marketed the um, rifle, the DDM4 V7 rifle that was used by the troubled 18 year old kid in Uvalde purchased just a couple of days after he turned 18. Um, and um, this was their social media post with the, including the Psalm, the, the biblical Psalm above um, about young kids and firearms. This was the post they had up on Twitter and Instagram the day of that shooting. Pretty depressing stuff. Okay. Let's uh, move across to you, Dr. Mark Langford. You're at UC Irvine. You specialize in treating some of these gunshot victims. You work at the Level 1 Trauma Center at UC Irvine Medical Center. Um, I read uh, some amazing research that you had published, which shone a light on a pretty overlooked area about these mass shootings, and that's the people that survive them. Um, and they often suffer horrific mental, physical injuries, and then compounded by financial difficulties. So here's a chart for people that can't see it. It puts the total number of deaths uh, so far from gun violence at 44,357, but the total number of injuries, 38,559. So those are people that survived these awful events. So you can see that there are an awful lot of them. Um, so this, this came from the Gun Violence Archive, which is an amazing website. Um, it just records data connected with all gun violence. And if you just type in the last 72 hours, you will be astounded 
at how much gun violence has taken place in the last 72 hours. It does it state by state, day by day, and it's pages and pages and pages. So tell us a little bit, Mark, about the kind of awful injuries uh, that you have to take care of in these people um, and how different is the damage that someone would get from an assault rifle compared to, say, the muskets. Here's a rifle um, ad, an assault rifle ad at a gun fair. Uh, the guy's dressed in very nice historic costume, but of course he's not shooting a musket. Um, so how far have we come from this original concept with the uh, founding fathers and the right to bear arms to, to this assault weapon? And how, how much damage, what sort of things do you have to deal with? Thank you, Mary. Well, I'm an emergency room doctor, and that's how I was trained. And I trained in Chicago, and we certainly had our share of uh, gang members and others shooting each other with generally small caliber handguns. Fast forward 35 years in my career, and the number of wounds that are happening in these mass shooting incidents from assault rifles are orders of magnitude greater than our founding fathers might have imagined. This graphic that you showed a moment ago at the gun show uh, mixes up the, mus the mus musket bearing militia person in 1787 with assault rifles that are uh, currently marketed and used in mass shootings. So in so my colleague uh, at the University of uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, Steve Hargarten, did an experiment when he looked at the firepower and the energy imparted by assault weapons, uh, for example, from the uh, assailant at the, at the Sandy Hook uh, Elementary School shooting, and determined that the number of bullets able to be fired from that assault weapon was 19 times what a single militia man would be able to fire from a musket ball, but the amount of energy that comes from that assault rifle is 171 times what would happen if a militia man uh, stormed a school. So the equivalent that happened at Sandy Hook was 171 militia men storming a school with that kind of firepower and the ability to impart mayhem, damage, death, and destruction. And so the when I've been, of course, aware of this over the past, you know, 30 years of my career, that the amount of gun violence has, has increased exponentially. And what gets highlighted in the media is the deaths. And because of privacy issues and uh, can't violate HIPAA, we don't really know what happens to the survivors and the victims. And there's a myth that I think the lay public thinks that if you make it to the hospital with a gunshot wound, you're going to be fine. And that's absolutely not the case. We chronicled the injuries from 403 survivors of mass shootings over the past 15 years and found horrific damage that was imparted by these rifles. Almost all of them were semi-automatic assault rifles and semi-automatic pistols. And what happens to these people is that if you get shot in a limb, with a shattered bone and a severed nerve, that limb, that arm, that leg is never normal again. Your whole life is affected. If you get shot in the abdomen, you end up with a colostomy. If you get shot, get shot in the kidney, you end up on dialysis. If you get shot in the chest, you're short of breath for the rest of your life. And 15 to 20 percent of survivors who got admitted to the hospital for gunshot wounds in our series ended up in nursing homes or rehab facilities. And the amount of emotional damage that causes, the amount of societal cost and repeat visits, repeat surgeries and emotional trauma is devastating. And so we wanted to bring another horrible aspect of mass shootings to the public's attention by studying the survivors. I think that's, that's a very important point because um, people can't really get a sense of the mental effects on top of the physical effects, that even witnessing a mass shooting for a child or an adult, but witnessing it, you may not even have any injury. You may, as you said, have some other form of injury. You may fall. You may have a uh, cardiac arrest, um, all sorts of other injuries that weren't directly from the gunshot, 
Um, and then you multiply that out to how many days that person is out of work. Maybe they're always out of work and can never return to work. The care is involved. The cost of the surgeries, you, you, you list one person that had 450000 worth of medical bills from surgeries subsequent to being a victim. This is one person. So how near are we to getting some kind of a national register going f- to collate this information and get some funding and help for these people? Well, two points. One is that there's a national death registry for firearm injuries that has been going on for several years, but it, sorry, for firearm deaths, not injuries. That's the point. So in our paper, we we had so much trouble getting information on the injured uh, victims because of all the privacy issues. We had to get human subjects approval for 33 hospitals, even to get the medical records of these poor folks who were injured and treated at the hospitals. So there is no current way to report that to the government for all the injuries, only for the deaths. So the national death reporting system needs to be expanded to the national injury reporting system from firearm uh, injuries. That's number one. Number two is the research to try to mitigate the harm of uh, gun violence has had almost no funding for the previous 20 years. And there was a moratorium on federal funding through the National Institutes of Health so that you couldn't get your your, uh, research funded. If you look at research in public health to how to reduce the injuries from car accidents or opiate uh, crisis or COVID more recently, there were tremendous strides made through research to reduce the amount of harm done for those conditions. For gun violence, there's been almost no research, only up until uh, 2020, where they started funding in the NIH to a modest degree, some firearm injury prevention and mitigation research. So we're 20 or 25 years behind where we might have been to understand all the factors that that we were discussing earlier and what are the motivations and how do we uh, try to make and potentially have a healthy relationship with guns. I would make the comment in terms of a healthy relationship with guns that I think that's a fallacy. And the reason for that is that responsible gun ownership is only responsible when you have life circumstances that allow you to be responsible. So it doesn't take into account crimes of passion. It doesn't take into account the onset of mental illness or substance abuse or alcoholism. You may be a responsible drug uh, gun owner today, but five years or 10 years from now, when you have a family crisis or the onset of dementia, or you get a fatal prognosis from a new illness. Those are life circumstances that are inevitable. And no matter how responsible you might have been with your gun under normal, stable circumstances, that's not a lifelong guarantee. And so if you have a gun in the house, you're 2.7 fold more likely to shoot somebody you know than to shoot an intruder or protect yourself. And what that feeds into is that if, as we said before, if the general public is buying guns at a ridiculous rate, accelerated rate, because they're afraid, then all of the public health advice about securing guns in gun safes, unloaded with the ammunition stored in a different place, none of that makes any sense, because that's completely contrary to why people are buying guns now. If you are really afraid of a home intruder, you're going to put your loaded gun in the bedside table, and that's where your three-year-old is going to find it and shoot his brother. And so this concept of responsible gun ownership has, has historical flaws and logical flaws in it that I don't think we can overcome. Those restrictions could help for preventing suicides because if the gun is truly secured and it's unloaded in a moment of of, uh, horrible despair, somebody might not be able to find the gun and use it to kill themselves, but it doesn't help those secured firearms and unloaded uh, state of that weapon, doesn't help with the uh, crimes of passion and the homicides, which make up about 45% of gun deaths. About 55% are suicides, we won't even talk much about that, but 45% are homicides, and you're more likely to shoot somebody you know. Ryan, do you want to come in on that at all? Well, 
<laughs> yeah, Mark, Mark is correct. I mean, I think, um, of course, I argue that responsible firearms ownership is possible because I think I am a responsible gun owner, and I think there are millions of them. And I think Mark is also correct that like life circumstances, of course, change. You could be a responsible driver today. You could have a stroke tomorrow, and by tomorrow, you wouldn't be a responsible driver. Um, so th those sorts of life changes apply to everything, to all of our rights in our life. The, the, where I would, you know, I would stress this, that nothing in our lives, though, as Americans, um, is is so uniquely poised to impact the rights and freedoms of others, as is our gun ownership, um, whether that be our family members or members of our community, because guns, in essence, are a tool that is designed to take a life. That's what that's what the gun is. And so even when when we target shoot, which my boys have been target shooting the last couple of days, um, without the without the commensurate sort of responsibility and safety procedures and everything else, things can go south so incredibly quickly. And and so I just I just think this is this is the test for our democracy. Can we do this? Can we extend a freedom this unbelievably powerful to it, to uh, ourselves as citizens who have the same mental health challenges, the same substance abuse challenges, the same angst and trouble at work as every other um, developed culture? Um, can we do that and not have it rip our country apart? I think that's our test. We've got a lot of questions that have come in already, and we've got more that have come in um, while you've been talking. Um, perhaps, perhaps um, Ryan, you could answer this one. What is the proportion of profits in the gun industry from military contracts compared to sales to private individuals? Yeah, I just typed that one in the in the chat. But generally speaking, very, very low to law enforcement and military, as low as 3 or 4% for some companies, maybe as much as 10 or 15% for more military focused companies the US commercial market is sort of it's it, it it's it's the hollywood of firearm sales for the entire world um for almost all firearms companies in the united states and and companies that sell into the united states it's i'd say it averages about 90 to 92% um sales to commercial so just average everyday people not law enforcement and military um 85% of the gun fatalities as witnessed by mark speaking about this just now in the emergency room, are caused by these assault rifles or guns. Why have they become the weapon of choice when they're really kind of military armaments, aren't they? How, how do we change from a handgun to having something that's usually seen on the battlefield? Well, um, AR-15s and um, similar assault weapons have become popular be largely, and I argue largely because they are a political symbol for the right. So it's a, it's the best way to own the libs. Also, it is a symbol of masculinity, and they're very, very effective, right? So people who don't quite understand how AR-15s work, I think the best analogy I've come up with is in a universe where there's lots of cars, think of cars and trucks. A great big truck is very powerful, but it's slow, it's cumbersome. An AR-15 is like a Formula One race car. It's not as powerful as a great big truck, but if you if you want to get from point A to point B very, very quickly and corner very fast and accelerate super quickly, um, that's kind of what an AR-15 does. It's meant, it's meant to be an offensive battle uh, rifle at short to medium ranges. And so, you know, would we throw a bunch of 18-year-old kids and unlicensed Formula One race cars on the road with no stop signs? I don't think so. Um, I don't think that'd be a good idea. And yet that's kind of what we're doing with AR-15s. Also, Mark, you mentioned that, um, I imagine when you trained as an emergency physician, you were not trained to be a battlefield doctor um, with the scale of uh, injuries. I mean, it's even being promoted as a kind of weapon of war. Um, how did you get up to speed on that? And it, do the military help you or do you help them? Well, as emergency physicians, we take care of patients who come in the emergency room who've been shot. And our trauma surgeon colleagues are the people who take care of the patient for the rest of their hospitalization or the rest of their life. They're the ones who do the surgeries. They're the ones along with, uh, you know, bone doctors, orthopedics and 
uh, stomach doctors and neurosurgeons, they're the ones who deal with these horrible injuries for the next day, week, month, or years. So we see the tip of the iceberg in the emergency room. And I want to make clear that the trauma system uh, involves trauma surgeons and many other surgical specialists who take care of these horribly injured patients for days, weeks, months, and years. Having said that, they are training for these difficult and high velocity injuries. And paradoxically, the US military is now as a pilot program sending military surgeons to urban trauma centers like ours in order to learn to deal with gunshot wounds. And so my trauma surgery partner, Dr. Michael Ekowa at UC Irvine, pioneers a program where the military sends people to us to learn how to deal with high velocity gunshot wounds. Um, it's not common, it's not usual, but it, it, it emphasizes the point that if the military has to send battle surgeons to urban trauma centers for training, there's something wrong with uh, the kinds of wounds that we're seeing. So Ryan, back to you, um, and then I'm going to go to more very good questions that have come in from the audience. Um, you now do advocacy against the gun industry, um, and you're a consultant both to Gabby Gifford, and you do a lot of public speaks speaking. Um, so what first steps do you think we can take uh, to focus on improving on the current situation we find ourselves in? In light of the fact you said to me there are dark days ahead and that this is a storm creating its own weather, um, how do we go about raising social awareness about the horror of these weapons and the awful long-term consequences of, of what happens when you're involved in a mass shooting? Well, um, I think we in the most sort of ethereal terms, that's not a particular thing we can do, but we have to rebalance our rights and freedoms versus our responsibilities. That's the general thing that we must do. We must start caring about um, the rights of those kids in Uvalde or Sandy Hook or their parents or their aunts and uncles. And I, um, the second time I testified to Congress, many of the Uvalde parents and families were there in the green room, in the support room, in the, in the congressional offices with me. And that was a very damn difficult thing to be there with those families, not even close to as difficult as what they must have endured. But responsible citizens and, and a responsible democracy cares about the rights of all people, not just a singular right. And we're, we're going to have to find a, a way to, to get our footing again. Right now, I fear that those scales are continued to be balanced in the wrong direction. But there, I do have some signs for hope when I wrote my book. I was fearful of this sort of trolling and maybe even physical attacks that myself and my family would receive because I have been very critical of the firearms industry and, and sort of the advertising and the marketing and some of the things that we see. And I did, I have gotten some ugliness, but um, I have gotten hundreds, probably thousands of responsible gun owners and families of gun owners and just people across the country who have written largely gr grammatically correct um, messages and emails that most of the hate is not gr grammatically correct. So I can spot that coming a mile away, but um, very supportive, thankful for me doing this, um, agreeing that we've gone too far, agreeing that we have to roll it back. Even some lifelong NRA members are like, I can't take this anymore. We've it's, it's threatening the country. It's. And so this sentiment is out there like much of the rest of our political sphere. We have to figure out a way to take the mic from the loud radical 10 or 15 percent that controls the conversation now and some of the policy we have to take that mic from them. and so generally quiet people who don't like confrontation and who don't like going to school board meetings and getting yelled at and don't want to be in the middle of debate you're i mean you're going to have to take a more active role in the democracy that's what we have to do and and ryan and mary it reminds me uh, when you mentioned gabby giffords when I was talking about the after effects of the of the gun, gunshot wounds, people may not understand that if you get shot in the head, your brain doesn't recover. Brain cells don't regenerate. Spinal cord cells don't regenerate. 
we are working on that in, in medicine, but you are paralyzed for the rest of your life if you get shot in the spinal cord. You are brain damaged for the rest of your life with problems thinking, problems with speech, problems with balance for the rest of your life if you get shot in the head. These are horrible, horrible wounds. And the concept, again, to reiterate what I said earlier, is you're not back to normal if you get shot anywhere. You've got long-term effects, especially the brain, spinal cord, gut, heart, heart, you don't survive, lungs, kidneys, all of them, and legs. You don't go back to normal. You are, you and your family are building a ramp so you can wheel your wheelchair up the three steps to your front door. And that's just a horrible lifelong uh, problem. So, even, Gabby, even Gabby Gifford, when she speaks now, has trouble with mm -hmm. speech, and that's part of the brain injury. Thank goodness yeah. she survived, but that just she, illustrates that that these people are lifelong affected. She did. She's wonderful. She's a hero, but she does. <clears throat> she has. She has a lot of difficulty. So this is a very good point somebody's raised here, which is. Uh, it it goes back to the table I showed at the beginning, which I didn't talk through, but it showed clearly how much, how many more thousands and thousands of weapons we have. I think it's 120.5 per 100 members of our US population. So it exceeds the population by 20 for every 100 people. So other countries have guns and they have rules, but they don't have anything like the problems that we have. So what do they do better? I know in England, I have one friend who's a vet. She has to have guns to cull deer. The police come every year to inspect the guns. The guns must be kept in a separate cabinet from the ammunition. And if those things have been any way not been met, they, 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 she loses the ability to have a gun. So I know that the scale would be massive if we had something like that here, but we could certainly limit the ownership and what about having people just shoot in gun clubs? If they want to play games, they can go like to a shooting range. And so I don't know, Mary, you know, I, I don't know what the exact answer to our situation is. I will just say the Swiss have a very, very high firearms ownership rate. And you don't read about too many. Um, you don't read about 1.6 mass shootings in Switzerland every day. Um, one of the reasons is because they have what is an essentially an aggressive permitting and mental background check um, system where you have to be re-verified. Again, I'm going to probably misstate this, but I think it's every couple years, you know, and you transport your guns and your ammo separately. So my point here is, is that um, I don't know that that would work or wouldn't work in the United States. My point is that there is a country that has lots of guns and has an aggressive permitting situation and they don't have lots of mass shooting. So that's just a data point that I think it's hard to get away from. So someone's actually asking, is there something particularly specific and unique about American culture that makes us so that makes gun violence and the gulf cultures so dangerous? What What is it about us? Did we watch too many uh, cowboy movies growing up? I mean, where is this coming from, this kind of lust for war? Well, I think this is what I call the 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 storm creating its own weather. Yeah, Japan has lots and lots of violent video games, probably a, a, a more prevalent video game culture than we have in the United States, and they don't have 1.6 mass shootings per day. Um, we have lots of video games, obviously. We have the same movies. We, we export our movies across the world and our culture across the world. So there's some unique mix of all this stuff. We have 425 million guns, and we're the only country that has that. So there's some mix of all of this that that is creating it. And when I, I again, I am fearful now that once the the fear and conspiracy and racism rise to the top to drive more of that in our society, and you have this for some, you know, guns guns can be a quick, easy answer. And I and look, if my family was being threatened or I was being threatened, I certainly want the right to defend myself. I don't I don't try to minimize that. But we're creating more and more situations where more and more people are fearful and more and more people need to defend themselves because more and more bad people have guns. This is a choice that we have made. It's in some ways, it's not even about what's legal and what isn't legal. It's like, is is this the country we want to live in? Um, this, These are the choices we are making. 
I think there's I, I think there's ways to reduce the amount of mass shootings, both suicides, mass shootings, and just gun violence in general. The emergency physicians uh, organization in California, the American College of Emergency Physicians, put out a very uh, thoughtful white paper on mitigation strategies about uh, bans on assault weapons, bans on high capacity magazines, red flag laws where you can't buy a gun if you have a restraining order against you, um, loop, closing loophole, loopholes at gun shows where there's no background checks. There are six or eight different strategies that we could implement short of trying to take somebody's gun away that would address the, to some degree, the both the mass shootings as well as the, you know, the interpersonal and interpersonal and uh, domestic violence that uh, results in so many deaths. So many uh, police responder deaths are related to domestic violence incidents. So there's ways that we can reduce this and we need research to inform us about the best ways the most effective ways to reduce the, the risk of death and injury from gun violence. That's why we need the funding from the federal government for gun violence and prevention research. Um, question down here, is the NRA still the most powerful gun lobby? What can be done, if anything, to mitigate the power of gun lobbies? I thought the NRA was bankrupt and defunct. So I had just picked out, I was just sitting, getting ready to type a uh, answer back to Nancy there. Um, that's the one I picked out too. Um, so the NRA, as I, as I asserted in my book, certainly for some time, I think was the most powerful political lobby, perhaps in the history of the United States, um, maybe save oil, but, um, it, and it is still quite powerful. They tried to declare bankruptcy. They couldn't, they are weakened now, but the, the sort of firestorm that they have let on our country is not weakened. And there are some even more radical groups that have spun out of the NRA. Think of the Firearms Policy Coalition, the Gun Owners of America, Second Amendment Foundation, smaller than the NRA. Many of them with several hundred or a couple million um, devotees that are far more radical than the NRA, way more radical. They want literally want the Bureau of Al Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms done away with. And they when the, the few words in the in the Second Amendment shall not be infringed, they literally believe those are literal were like nothing like should 18 year olds have a 10 warthog jets yes should they they literally believe this and so that that the sort of radicalized base that the nra created is morphing into that and it's something you people i'm sorry to frighten but people may wish for the good old days of the moderate nra and i know that sounds a bit crazy but that but that that it could be where we're headed Somebody's asking if even the police couldn't deal with the Uvalde shooter, why hasn't that made any difference? I answered that one too. Um, I think that's a very good point. The police were petrified, literally scared stiff at Uvalde because they knew that the kid had a tricked out, he had a $2,000 AR-15 top quality, better than the military is equipped with. And he had... Um, at last count, I think he had 30 or 50 um, high capacity magazines with him. And if if the cops who are charged with protecting those kids are so petrified of that gun, and by the way, the industry insists, the firearms industry insists that, that that's on an AR-15. They now insist that it be called a modern sporting rifle, MSR, as if it's just like a average deer hunting rifle. It's not just an average deer hunting rifle. And I think that the evidence for, for police being too petrified to enter a school to save those kids because the, the kid was e equipped with one is all you need to know. Okay, we've got about five or six minutes. Um, somebody else. And, and just, just, to, just to expand on that, mm -hmm. the surgeons who were interviewed who tried to take care of the Uvalde victims described tissue that was just pulverized, children who were decapitated, limbs that were severed. It wasn't, you know, a little hole in, in your arm. These were destroyed carcasses is what they described, the poor surgeons who had to deal with the, the victims who died. Um, just to, it's not a modern hunting rifle. 
It's a weapon like Mr. Boosie described. Somebody has asked a question here. Um, with so much public support, can a new organization of responsible gun owners emerge to promote gun safety like the NRA used to? Um, I hope so, and we better. Um, I think that's the question, whether, and, and it's not dissimilar from, from what we're seeing on the right side of, of politics, right? Is there going to be a responsible slice of people stand up and say um, what needs to be said on the right so we can um, regain our footing there? Same thing needs to happen in firearms ownership. It exists. I know it exists. I hear them. But the problem is, is that, is that decent, quiet, law-abiding, just go their own way people are not the sort of folks that generally become advocates and loud and change makers, right? That's that's why we, it, it's so easy for this fringe in both specters, both in guns and in right-wing politics, for 10 or 15% of the people to own so much of the influence. We've got to figure out a way to, to undo that. I, I, I guess the hopeful thing is they're out there. The distressing thing is they've not yet stepped up. Someone has asked, how can I talk to my sister-in-law who's very pro-gun about these issues? How can I lead her into a conversation? <laughs> Any ideas? Well, one thing I say is that the most pro-Second Amendment stance is the one in which um, responsibility is advocated for the loudest. Um, I don't think it's patriotic or constitutionally conservative to not worry about the rights of others. I don't think it's going to prove to be, quote unquote, pro-gun to endanger the very democracy that grants us the right to have the guns. And so if you want, like, I think a true Second Amendment patriot does what it takes to maintain those rights. And that means embracing the sort of responsible behaviors and regulations um, that are necessary. And so I, that that's my stance. I believe that. And so I I kind of call on the better angels of people who call themselves responsible gun owners and say, okay, well then let's be both parts of that responsible and gun owner. Do you have anything to weigh in with that, Mark? You know, I, I, I hope that people never see what happens to people who get shot. That was one of my questions to you. Someone and else. no, you can't bring the public, you can't bring your sister-in-law into the emergency room and see this is this is the reality of somebody who got shot. That's not feasible. But for what it's worth, talking to an emergency doctor for 35 years, you don't want to see that. And it's not. And if the chance of that happening to your loved one is one in 10,000 or one in 100,000, then you need to pay attention to that because you could be a victim of that and somebody in your family could be a victim of a crime of passion or uh, a suicide um, if the gun is unsecured and, and left to irresponsible people. Well, you've given us an awful lot to think about today. I, I think I would advise people to pick this book up if they want to get a good background um, education about the history of gun ownership in this country and the legal path that brought us to where we are right now. Um, and maybe, Maybe you can suggest some organizations, Ryan, that people could sign up to, or what's what's your view on that? Well, I um, I I work and advise. I work for Giffords and advise Giffords, um, and they're working to stand up Gun Owners for Safety, which is an organization of gun owners that says we are responsible gun owners and we also believe in being responsible. I think I think that's a good one, and there's there's lots of others mm -hmm. out there. Um, Moms Demand Action. What a what a great group. I mean, I. I don't know that I've ever seen a more effective, um, you know, political organizing organization than what than what they've done. There, there's so many good ones out there. But I, I will say, I really don't. I don't mean this to be callous, but I don't really care what your issue is in the country. I'm I'm a huge environmental advocate. That's kind of my thing. I mean, guns really, other than me writing this book and then in the industry, that that hasn't been my thing. But I recognize the centrality of guns 
to everything else that we care about. I don't think that we're going to radically improve all women's reproductive rights or in the environment or public education or all these other things. I think they're all kind of now tied to this all or nothingism of guns. And so I think it is important that people engage in this and cool the temperature down and rebalance our responsibility and rights here. Because I think if we don't do it here, none of that other stuff's ever going to improve. Very good point. Well, um, the time has come, I'm afraid. That hour has flown by. I hope this has been helpful to uh, people and education. It certainly was to me. Um, I'd like to thank our two wonderful speakers today for their insight and their time. Activist and author Ryan Bussey and Professor and Emergency Physician Dr. Mark Landorf. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us too, audience. I hope you have a safe and happy summer and I'll see you all in the fall and thank you all again for joining us. <laughs>